It's an absolute pleasure to welcome you all to a wonderfully sunny Galway this morning, the home of my alma mater. I haven't been here in so, so long. It was great to see so many faces that I haven't seen in such a long time or faces that I've just seen on screens and to go back to the awkward. I know. It's, it's, it's a really good way. They have to come to the conference. They kind of have to be here. But Galway, Salt Hill in particular, like it's one of those places that I always associated with sun. And I woke up this morning and I could see the fairground ride of Leisureland. That's where we used to come when we were younger for our holidays. We'd all pack into the back of our Renault 21 and come down to Galway for the day and go for a dip in the sea and then go to Leisureland and spend all our parents' money. But as I got older, and I came to, to Galway, I started to associate Salt Hill. And, you know, this area, because I lived at the top of the hill in Dunaris, and I started to associate this with the smell of fried minced beef. <laughs> and I'll explain why. In my first year in college, I shared a house, a little apartment in Dunaris, with a friend of mine from Mullingar, 17, 18 years of age, every day, we would come home and try and figure out what we could cook for dinner. And he was an engineer, he was a civil engineer, so he was very functional in his thinking, and very clever in a lot of ways. And he, on a daily basis, would fry two days' worth of Dunstore's finest minced beef on a pan with nothing else. <laughs> and he would boil some spuds, and he would mash them up, and then he would get tomato ketchup, chef, not Heinz, pour it all over it, and he would consume with a plum. And that went on for first year and second year when Terryland, when Hedford Road started to develop and we moved there. Then in third year, something happened. <clears throat> he met his now wife that summer, and she was living two roads over from us in uh, Newcastle, in Greenfields, if any of you know it. And I remember the Tuesday afternoon that I cycled home from a tutorial, a psychology tutorial, came in the door, and lo and behold, where was Owen? Standing over the hob, frying his mince. But we only talked about this recently, because I said, I, I, his consent to tell this story, by the way. <laughs> and he said, geez, I remember that afternoon as well. And he was standing over the hob, and he was frying the mince, as usual. But he goes, watch, watch and he opens a Dalmio jar <laughs> and pours it in. And he goes, spag ball. <laughs> and no longer was he cooking spuds, but he was cooking spaghetti. And as the year went on, and as Fiona visited us more and more and more, there were mushrooms, there were peppers, there were onions. There was all sorts of fancy stuff going into his spaghetti bolognese. And when I think about it in first year, it was absolutely rational for Owen to cook fried minced beef. It was cheap, it was easy to cook, it was going to fill his tummy and keep the hangovers at bay. And that was important. And when I think of that story, I think of ABA. All right? Now you're going, where is this going? But when I think of ABA, I think of us a little bit like minced beef in Owen's story, all right? We're, we are at the core, we're a core ingredient of so many things that are going on in the world right now. But we're not gonna get married on the back of serving up minced beef to people. There are added ingredients that people are bringing into the frame that make it more palatable. We see finance experts, we see marketers, we see sociologists, we see transport experts, leveraging the science of behavior change in order to improve their subject. And when I think about ABA, I see they can't do this. So many of today's problems, so many social issues that are presented today can be solved with behavioral science. And this is an issue that I have, by the way. This is a problem that I have, and I brought 
three eminent guests with me to stop me going off on a rampage today and to learn from them from other fields. And I'll introduce them in a minute. I'd hope that I'd be able to present this on a screen, but you're going to have to bear with me on a laptop, okay? I can't help seeing behavioral science solutions everywhere. And I'm thinking about user experience design. I'm thinking about car design. I'm thinking about building design. I'm thinking about 15 minute cities, as well as services, apps, websites, all of the software that we interact on a daily basis has leveraged behavioral science to become user friendly and better. But I'm gonna start with a, a tub of Little's finest Greek yogurt. And none of you can see this, the effect is lost. <laughs> but you can imagine it, it's a large tub of, of Little's finest Greek yogurt. And I got up one morning, and I'm the proud father of a 10 month old, so I had to change a nappy. I also have an 18 month old dog that poos on the floor, so I picked up her poo and put it in the bin, and then I changed his nappy and put it away. And then I went to take the yogurt out of the fridge and the thing fell on the ground and it smashed. So the, the, the tub cracked, okay? And I said, oh no, I don't want to waste it. It's a whole new yogurt box, all right? And then my wife came down and she said, do you know what? There is an old carton in the recycling bin. I'm gonna put this underneath. So now what we have are two handles two tubs and one stash of yogurt, right? Bear with me. This is not going to be like a culinary journey for the next two hours. <laughs> and she said, oh, by the way, just use this handle, bearing in mind it's like six o'clock in the morning, just use this handle, don't use this handle, because if you do, it'll fall out again. And I said, hold on a second, my dear. I'm gonna took a scissors and I cut the handle of the top one, so I removed any chance of a mistake being made. So what I leveraged there, and I said to her, that's behavioral science, baby. <laughs> and I said, now what we've done is we've removed the possibility of a mistake being made, so the correct handle is the default option. She said, get out of the house, okay? <laughs> so already, like, that's how bad it is. That's how bad it's got. In the background, you'd be able to see that it's dark in the background. There are tweets that I see. To read it out for you, this is a tweet I came across saying, a smart way to motivate people to get their COVID shots in, use holidays as deadlines for goal setting. Hashtag behavioral economics. And I said, I want to be on that party. I want to be part of big campaigns to encourage people to take COVID, COVID vaccines. I said, that's, that's our gig that people were leveraging, using the prompt, the natural habit stacking of it's coming towards Christmas, you have six weeks left, get your COVID uh, jab here, here are the benefits of this, and it informed the communication for this. It's using behavior change for social good. Another one, you see, um, if you offer a subscription service that allows somebody to sign up from your website, you should allow people to unsubscribe from your website, forcing people to call, Stay on hold for 20 minutes, we've all been there. And then, fight, uh, and then fight, being talked into staying on is not cool. We've done this with gym memberships. We've done this with internet subscriptions. We've done this with travel insurance. And the environment that we work in is starting to be influenced by behavioral science to make signing up for these things dead easy, but unsubscribing much more difficult knowing that, yeah, you know, human behavior leverages itself towards the path of least resistance. Um, this is a nice one. I just won't drive in. I, I don't know why or how I found the Cambridgeshire Live newspaper on my computer, but I did. And it said, I just won't drive in. Cambridge residents react to congestion charge plans. I won't drive in. Well, that's what we want you to do. We want you to find an alternative way. A congestion charge, as we know, is some sort of punisher or an aversive. It's a response. Gosh, you can argue the toss on this, but people are doing this. Town planners are trying to do this, but they're doing it. They're kind of using piecemeal approaches to it. So I can't help seeing it. And then, of course, in New Zealand, we had protesters outside of the parliament buildings for weeks on end. 
and you have a report in the BBC News saying New Zealand police play Barry Manilow to repel Parliament protesters. <laughs> and then you have James Blunt tweeting, give me a shout if this doesn't work. <laughs> And I look at the responses to protests in other countries, where there's not a behavioral approach, where there is a hard-handed regulatory approach where aggression meets aggression. And I see the consequences of that, and I think, God, you know what? There are some behavior analysts here rubbing their hands going, you know what, just try a bit of Barry Manilow. <laughs> Give it a shot. If nothing else, what the protesters did is they started playing back ABBA, I think. But you can imagine, we know from working in difficult situations that bringing humor, bringing the, the tone down can help frame a situation, can frame behavior, even if Barry Manilow is not that aversive. I'm going to introduce my guests. Louise Ward calls herself chief busybody in her job. That's her, her title. Um, Louise is working with 42 courses, but during lockdown, you know, some of us made banana bread, some of us baked sourdough, some of us made a podcast, some of us wrote different things. Louise formed a behavioral science club on LinkedIn that currently has 5,647 members. I had never met Louise in person until yesterday afternoon when she walked up my cul-de-sac with her suitcase with her. And Louise is a phenomenal person because her background is not in behavioral science at all, but her passion for reading, her curiosity around the field, coming from a marketing background really, really interests me. And if nothing else, I want to understand how you create a worldwide community of 5,647 people who on a weekly basis talk about behavioral science. Beside Louise is Dr. Shane Timmons. Shane is another person who I played during lockdown because Shane was doing some really cool work with the ESRI Behavioral Research Unit. So since 2008, behavioral science with the book Nudge, written by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein, you started to see large, bodies such as the United Nations, UNESCO, uh, the World Health Organization, the European Union, all going, hold on a second here, what's this behavioral science thing that everybody's talking about? Only since about 2010. It's exploded in the last 12 years to the point where there are now nearly 200 different behavioral science units around the world looking at social problems and saying, how can we leverage the knowledge of behavioral science to help solve some of the things that are cropping up? More important than yogurt, right? Shane is part of the Irish Behavioral Research Unit with the ESRI. He's been doing some cracking work. He's trying to, still trying to get away from the COVID work, but he's been really, really central to feeding in the government response over the last two years to messaging, to understanding human behavior around COVID, and using behavioral insights to influence policy, which I can only see as a really positive outlook. And then I don't need to introduce the final person, but I will. It's Julian Leslie, and Julian has been Mr. DBA for 15 years and Mr. ABA for years before that. So we've all, the four of us have all arrived in the same town, but we've taken a different road to get into that town. So today, what I want to do is to pick their brains. And I want, we're going to spend the next hour and a half, I guess, going through some of these developments and understanding why is this party going on? And what do we need to do to be invited to it? And if there's a secret sauce to getting involved, what does that involve? So I've given them a spoiler alert. And they, the kind of themes that I see Emerging, I'll summarize them and then we'll, we'll talk, are I think effective dissemination. If you asked me at the start of lockdown who my favorite behavior analyst in the world is, I would have said Charles Duhigg because he wrote The Power of Habit. 
and it had such a huge outreach. Imagine my dismay and horror to learn that Charles Duhigg is but a journalist with the New York Times, who can effectively communicate the science that people have been working on for decades, but in a way that people can relate to. I think that storytelling is important, like what Charles Duhigg did, and that will help us to find that secret sauce. I think, and we're going to talk about this, and I want to really pick Louise and Shane's brain about this, is that we can work with subject specialists. That if we're going to be talking about health behavior change, let's collaborate with doctors. Let's collaborate with coaches. Let's collaborate with dietitians. If we're going to be helping develop apps, software, online experiences, let's collaborate with software engineers and tech experts. If we're going to try and find better ways to encourage people to take public transport, we need to be talking with people who are experts in transport and lobby groups. I could go on and on and on. Road safety, user experience designers, design experts, marketers and creatives, architects and engineers. But I want to pick these guys' brains. So, um, Shane, the man in the middle. Yeah, well, I, over the last year, you've been very generous with your time. For me, appearing on a podcast, spending time listening to me ramble and talking with you about the work that you do, but you've also been very vocal on a national stage communicating your work. But tell us, what problems do you solve with the ESRI Behavioural Search Unit? Uh, well, I wouldn't go as far to say that we solve them. Um, we certainly try. Uh, pretty varied um, in what we do. So um, the kind of main spheres that we work in are things like consumer decision making, health, the environment. They sound kind of um, abstract. Um, so I'll just give, give some examples of what we do. One that I'm working on at the moment uh, is in partnership with one of the high street banks where we're trying to change the application form for savings accounts um, for people who might need to save for an unexpected expense. Um, and so we saw from that kind of spoiler for the results that are coming out in a few weeks is that we changed the behavior of one in four people who had started the form, but otherwise would have dropped off just by kind of tweaking the, the form. One of the changes that worked really well was um, asking people about when they plan to start saving on the first page of the form rather than the last page of the form. Um, so that just simple change alone kind of uh, led to a quite a large change in behavior for people. Um, we look at stuff to do with uh, climate change as well. So I've recently published um, a report on how well people understand climate change and then the effect that engaging with climate science has on support for mitigation. And then in the health space, yeah, it's pretty much been COVID um, for the last uh, two years, as you might expect. But we are looking into other things like active travel or uh, my colleague Deirdre Robertson uh, does a lot on food choice. So how is nutritional food, how are nutritional information labeled on foods? what happens if you change the location of calories on a menu? So calorie posting is coming in in a few years. In Ireland, the Department of Health has, has committed to that. Um, and she found in her research, which used an eye tracker um, on participants who weren't aware that this was part of the experiment, consent was gotten afterwards, um, that if you change the position of the calories on the label, uh, on the, the menu, people will order different foods. The effect was actually larger for men, which I think surprised some people uh, initially, but that was because women just knew the calories more. Um, than, than men did. So yeah, quite a, quite a varied kind of sphere of research that we're doing, but there's some examples. There's some really good examples of what, what Taylor and Sunstein call choice architecture, okay? It's a term that I had never come across until I read their book. And as I started to learn what choice architecture was, all I could think of was this is just antecedent intervention here. We learn about this all the time, changing the way we present options to people. Now, what's really important is that none of this is regulatory. None of this is, is punishment-based. All of it is antecedent-based intervention. And, and Taylor and Sunstein talk about libertarian paternalism. You Americans and your long words. Libertarian paternalism, right? Now, what is libertarian paternalism? It's an oxymoron in ways. Libertarian means you have freedom of choice, Orla. You have freedom of choice. You can do what you want, right? We understand this because we work in the field of disability and now the Assisted Decision Making Act is just coming on board and it is becoming more important for us to understand the will and preference of people. 
So you have freedom of choice. However, we're going to be paternalistic in this as well. And this is what Shane is talking about, that you can choose whatever you want on the menu, but we know if we give you the calorie intake or how much the carbon footprint of this is going to be, that's going to kind of make you reconsider. So I like to think about this in an Irish, if I was an Irish term, it would be like that man on a building site who says, no, I'm not telling your business there, but I think twice again before I do that, right? And that's kind of what it is. It's saying, here's what you can eat, but we're going to change the application form to say, are you sure you don't want to save a bit more? Are you sure you want to make this choice and not that choice? And all of this is behaviorally informed. Tell me about the, uh, some of the outcomes that you're getting from that work. Yeah, so the first thing to, I guess, stress with anything we do is that um, we acknowledge firstly that we don't know if it's going to have the effect it is and the importance of measuring um, if it has had that effect. Um, so I mentioned the, the savings account, that was a successful intervention. So um, these are people who themselves had decided they wanted to save. So we didn't kind of manipulate them into thinking saving is a good thing. Um, they'd started the form themselves. They were just more likely to finish it when we kind of made some behaviorally informed tweaks to it. Um, other outcomes that we looked at in that study as well were, were things like, okay, we have also their borrowing information. So we need to make sure that if people are going to save more, they're not going to borrow more to make up for it. And then they're paying debt back at a high interest rate. So we did all those sorts of checks and that, that was all fine, thankfully. Probably spent more time checking that stuff than, than the actual uh, results from it. Um, mentioned with the calorie posting as well. So people did lower their calorie intake. Uh, so they lowered the number of calories that they ordered off the menu. Uh, we also had an intern at the time, so after people kind of um, had finished their lunch, the intern would take the lunch out of the bin and weigh it um, to see... <laughs> Always the interns get those yeah, jobs. <laughs> yeah. um, I did it on a few occasions myself, um, to see the amount of food that was eaten. Um, and again, when people had calories posted on a particular position on the menu, that made a difference. What's really important, I think, to stress about this as well is that we had two uh, conditions for it. So one of them was you saw the food, then the calories, then the price. The logic there being that if you want to see the price, you kind of have to read the calories. The other condition was the food, the price, the calories. And then we had a third condition where there's no one saw any calories. When the calories was after the price, that's where we saw the effect. Having the calories before the price, where uh, we thought beforehand, people can't skip over this information. They're going to have to absorb it. Um, it made no difference. What we saw then, so I mentioned that their eyes were being tracked on the menu, so we had a, an eye tracker on the on the screen as well. You could see that people were looking at the different food options, kind of narrowing it down to, okay, I'm going to go for this one or this one, and then they would look at the calorie information. So that was the kind of the last aspect in the decision. So the, these are all the sort of um, outcomes that we as researchers are terribly interested in and kind of how people make um, these sorts of decisions. The policymakers just want to know, does it work? Now, it doesn't always work. Um, so another uh, trial that we had, I'm conscious I don't want to take up uh, too much time just talking about my own research here. Um, another trial we had was trying to encourage people to become more physically active. Um, the intervention was run uh, with uh, walking groups um, uh, in uh, play schools. So uh, people in lower socioeconomic areas would drop their kids to a play school and they could sign up to a walking group and then just go for a walk for an hour. With that one, it didn't work. Um, so we found that people did sign up to the walking group, but it nearly seemed like signing up to it was enough. Um, that when we looked at the control group, so the people who were not offered the walking group, in the end, they actually reported walking more and exercising more. Um, so that was a clear example of, okay, here's a really well-intentioned intervention that the behavioral science says it's gonna work, we're kind of putting it at a convenient time for people, but it was the signing up that kind of, um, our kind of post hoc um, or after the fact interpretation of it is it's kind of licensed you to all right, I'm going to go on that walking group tomorrow so I don't need to do it then the walking group comes around it doesn't suit at the time so you don't do it um, so there's kind of it's not all not always um, that we get the, the outcome that we we desire but this is why we we test and measure yeah it sounds like my uh, <laughs> that's why I don't post any gym selfies on social media a because I don't go to the gym but b the minute I do it I end up thinking, ah, that's great. Now everyone knows I'm going to the gym. I don't have to go again, you know? And it's a, it's a weird phenomenon. I had heard that phenomenon that they, we feel like immediately when we tell somebody that we're going to do it, we almost feel like, ah, okay, I'm, I'm somewhat, some part of the way there. And it, it takes away from the need to, to engage in it, which, like you said, is against what the behavioral science would tell us, that if you 
create commitment partners and you set yourself a goal, you would expect it to occur. That's great. Thanks, Shane. Louise. Hello. Louise is always smiley. We came the whole way from Dublin to, to Galway and she just beamed with energy the whole way down. I had to keep my eyes on the road, but I knew she was smiling along the way. Uh, Louise, your marketing background is really interesting because I see so many policymakers traditionally and, and private entities going to marketers for their behavioral science needs. Marketers are good at marketing, right? Um, but I'm really interested to explore, you've come from marketing towards behavioral science. How do you see those two things overlap? So my background is actually not in marketing, it's in market research. I'm not sure if my mic is working, is in market research. Uh, but my journey to behavioral science was definitely through marketing. And despite having worked in market research for 20 years, behavioral science, behavioral economics, it just hadn't crossed my desk at all. Um, at the start of lockdown, I saw an event advertised by Ogle, the advertising agency. I knew then my father worked in advertising, so it sounds interesting. And they were hosting a behavioral science festival. They call it Nudge Stock. So I'm going to sign into that. It went on all day, and it just completely transformed the way that I saw things. Um, and I thought, I've got to get into this. I've got to find out more about this subject. And uh, as uh, you were being told earlier, in the chat at the side, whilst this is going on, and you've all signed into events where you're able to uh, chat to people, I put a note up, and I was like, oh, I've collected here a list of the books of the speakers at this particular event. And this kind of went <laughs> a bit viral with other people who were interested in finding out about the speakers, finding out about their books. And um, as you were just told there, I set up this group uh, with a guy in India, my co-host Prakash Sharma. And uh, we just launched into it. It was an experiment. It's like, well, if there's other people who are interested in this, maybe they'll maybe they'll join us. And they did join us, and we've been running it for nearly two years now. And uh, we meet every Saturday in Zoom, and we invite along a speaker who could be um, a Nobel Prize winning author like Cass Sunstein, could be a um, habit and change specialist like Katie Miltman out of UPenn, um, it could be somebody who's practicing behavioral science in industry. We've had the head of behavioral science of Coca-Cola, head of behavioral science of Kellogg's. Um, and yeah, they just accept our invitation and they come to talk to us and we ask them questions. I'm eminently curious. And uh, as I've said to you before, it's, it has changed my life. Mm. Um, and I've done a lot of research into the previous nudge stock events, which you may or may not have heard of, most people haven't heard of it, but Ogilvy back in 2013, uh, Rory Sutherland and Jez Groom in Ogilvy set up a unit called Ogilvy Change. And this was to be their behavioral science unit where they were start, starting to put into practice a few of the things from, as Porrick was saying to you, from nudge, from Thinking Fast and Slow by Danny Kahneman, uh, from Predictably Irrational by Dan Ariely, who are sort of like the three sort of groundwork and possible sort of Bibles of behavioral science evolved a long way since that time. And uh, they put on an event. It was held in London. They had about 16 guests. And actually at that very first event, it's like they laid the groundwork for how it was to go on because they had... Um, uh, Nazim Nicholas Taleb, the mathematician and great thinker, author of Anti-Fragile, uh, Black Swan. They had uh, Laurie Santos, who's a professor out of Yale, who um, has had the most successful online course for happiness. Um, and they also had... Uh, a chap called Paul Dolan, who's a professor out of London School of Economics, and again has written two best-selling books in happiness. And 
I think that links in in a way with what you were saying before about bringing your science, your psychology. You know, pop science is sort of considered a dirty word by people who are a little bit le learned, but at the end of the day, if you want to share your message, you have to speak the language of the people who are receiving your message, and there's no point presenting academia if it's not accessible to the readers. I'm interested in the subjects that arise, because you said something there, Louise, about making the content that you have engaging for the listener. I'm interested to know who are these 5,647 people, because they can't all be behavioral scientists. They can't all be behavioral analysts. Who the hell are they? <laughs> Who's interested in this? Stuff? I was talking with one of your members out there about this subject, and it's an extremely diverse group of people. And it could be uh, somebody like myself, who at that time was absolutely new to the subject, wants to learn more about the subject. They might have maybe seen that Katie Milkman's got a new book out. And they're like, what is this how to change? Or what is this habit business? And so they join us and they want to learn more about it. Um, it could be that it's, it's somebody who's a, a, a double masters in behavioral science, behavioral economics, and they equally join us, contribute some very complicated questions to whoever is our guest at the time, but it's an extremely diverse group of people who have come together with this curiosity, love for learning, wanting to share a message of, as you say, there's a party going on and it's just great fun. And that when you become enthusiastic about it, it becomes more than the subject you're studying or the job that you're doing. It becomes a new way of thinking. And as Porig said, it may sound like a cult, but as Porig said, you actually can't switch it off because then when you see things, when you are putting your yogurt back mm. in the fridge. Yeah. You, yeah, you're, you're always conscious of this behavioral lens, which be it behavioral economics, be it seeing it as an anthropologist, seeing it as a psychologist, you're always seeing it with a behavioral lens, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily a new story. And many of the terms, as Porig and I talk about many of the terms that are used, are a new language for something that you guys would be very familiar with. Mm -hmm. But what they've done is they've opened the door to people who haven't necessarily got specialities in those subjects. Yeah, the, the term curious came, came up there, and it came up a lot in conversations that we have had in the past, that these aren't necessarily 5,000 experts, but they're 5,000 curious people. Because what's interesting about this, and, and Julian, I want to get you in on this, is that it's only really exploded since 2010. So it is not an established science. It is taking from areas of neuroscience, cognitive psychology, behavior analysis, economics, to, to try and create a new discipline. But that curiosity really is, is interesting that people are, are willing to learn and saying this is not perfect but we're trying to figure it all out. Um, Julian, uh, we, uh, we chatted last night, and I just love hearing about the history of ABA. And if you, any of you get a chance to uh, look at the posters later on, Julian has a poster. Is it a, is it a photo album or a poster of all of the conferences that you have attended? <laughs> no, no it, it was just a list of events that took place in the 1970s. Oh, 90, yeah. I don't you know, know whether you know, there were 70s before the, which were before, before the 80s, which you might remember. Yeah, uh, the 70s. <laughs> So he's got, I thought there were going to be photos. I'm kind of disappointed now. I was hoping no, to no, no. see some, some fad there's a, there's fashion a very, there's and a, hairstyles. And no, there's, there is a picture of me taken in 1978 on it. Nice. All right. But Julian, what I want to know is that have, you've been working in the field of ABA in, in, in Ulster University since the 70s, right up until now. Have you felt this change or the, you know, the ripple effect of this behavioral science explosion that has, seems to have occurred, or has it, how have you noticed it, or have you noticed it? I, I think it'd be fair to say that if you, if you think of the ABA 
community worldwide, it hasn't really been affected by it very much. You might say that, that is it the ABA community is still too inward looking or not looking outward enough to see what's going on around it. And I suppose that there would be a negative side that would say, God, they've just pinched some of our ideas and now they're getting, they're getting a lot of money, they're getting a lot of, a lot of traction and they're attracting a lot of interest from people like in, with marketing and wider backgrounds, which we didn't succeed in doing. I mean, one of the things that Louise just said, which you already picked up on, was that you have to speak the language of the people receiving the message if, if, you, want them to, if you want to successfully transmit the message. And I've been, at, at, um, I've been to many behavior analysis conferences where the president of some organization like ABAI has actually taken that as a theme. Uh, that we've, we've known within the field for decades that we're not that successful in transmitting <coughs> the uh, outside of our our own area to, the, to the, all the many, as you, as you so elegantly pointed out, the many adjoining ad ad fields that we could get more involved in. <coughs> and we have this problem all the time. I, I'm sure everyone in the room is familiar with this from their own work or from classes they've been in. <coughs> should, should we use technical language to describe the nuts and bolts of what we do? And we say when we're teaching, we say, well, we have to use them some of the time because that's the only way we get properly defined terms. And if we're going to have a science, it has to have properly defined terms. And then <clears throat> you uh, almost invariably, people in the room who are successful practitioners and successful in the way that they manage to interact with parents and organizations and so on, they say, yeah, but I never use that language with them. And I've got my, I've got my ways of presenting it. <clears throat> um, one of the things uh, we were talking about, Boric and I were talking about earlier this morning, I was actually refer referring back to somebody uh, uh, who used to be on the, on the faculty in Trinity, which was Ray Fuller, and some of you will remember, but he's, he, left, he retired a number of years ago now. <clears throat> now, basically, Ray was a behavior analyst, but he never presented himself as that. He presented himself as an applied psychologist, and he did a lot of work with the Road Safety Authority in Ireland on stuff that now relates to the sort of work that Shane's doing. And he also got involved in aviation psychology and got some big grants to, 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 to do work on safety there. <clears throat> But he was just, so he, that's what he was. He was a specialist in transport coming from a psychology background. But if you look, if you read his papers, and he wrote scholarly papers about it, of course, they're, they're, he's just applying behavioral principles. Uh, and he's, and he's, he's cut the crap, if you like. He's gone and done it and, and started just working in the field. And of course, once he did that, <clears throat> people came back to him because he'd run a successful project before, et cetera, et cetera. And he had the, and he had the links. He knew all these people in whichever industry it was by then. And that, and that kept him going. And he was, had a 20-year applied research career d doing that. And he didn't start off uh, you know, within, a, within the sort of ABA frameworks that most of the people in this room are kind of working in or aspiring to work in. He did it yeah. you know, by just getting involved in a particular applied area as mm. a working lecturer in, in, in Dublin at the time. It's, it's funny, I, <clears throat> poor Louise, I gave her a lift down yesterday and she called to the house and my 10 month old is in the walker going around the kitchen there was a vis another visitor in the house with her baby. And there's yogurt all over the floor as well. There was yogurt all over the floor. <laughs> and then Louise, who I'd never met before, comes to the door. And then she comes in. And I'm saying, right, we're going to go. You know, if anyone here is a parent, you're like, we're going to go, we're going to go, we're going to go. And, and then you're going, oh, wait, just one more thing, right? And we're going to go, we're going to go, we're going to go. And then I get a knock on the door, and it's the plumber. <clears throat> We'd asked a plumber to come and try and fix our shower. And he chooses this time to arrive. And I say, Louise, have another coffee there, right? And I'm upstairs with the plumber and we're standing in the shower and I'm showing him the part, <laughs> part-time psychologist, full-time plumber assistant, right? And he starts to, nice fella, but he starts to explain to me how the plumbing thing works in the shower. Right? And he starts talking about washers and filters and, you know, this, this kind of, you know, you need this kind of ice grips and that kind of ice grips. And, you know, and I said, buddy, I don't care. I want to, you to fix the shower. I just want your, your criteria, my criteria for you being useful to me right now is if tomorrow morning I'm standing in the shower and I'm getting all sorts of different temperatures and the right kind of pressure. I don't need to know the ins and outs of this. Why am I telling you this? Because sometimes we feel like we have to explain all of the mechanisms of what's going on. And I don't think we do. I think when going back to what Louise had said around 
policymakers or industry or people who are interested in learning a bit more. Yeah, they want to know some of the mechanisms of this, but it's not the first thing that we should be telling them about. Predominantly, I think the strength of behavior analysis and behavioral psychology and behavioral science, whatever you want to call it, is the how-to. Is the how-to. I think that one of the real skills of a behavior analyst is problem solving. It is somebody saying, I want to lose a few pounds. And I don't just want to wear black to make myself look slimming, I want to be slim, all right? But my intention is this. What is my behavior? And how can I bridge that gap? We have dietitians, We have health specialists. We have people who can tell us what we should be doing. But how do we do that? And how do we understand those underlying mechanisms that influence our behavior? And what can we do about it? That's where we come in. We don't need to tell them all of the underlying influences. But if we can help design effective environments, effective products, effective services, then we're on to something. This is where our collaboration comes in. And Shane, you work and collaborate with a lot of different disciplines. Your team isn't just behavior analysts. You're not even a behavior analyst yourself. No, I'm an imposter. <laughs> <laughs> Take him out now, can I? <laughs> you're a cog you're, you have a PhD in cognitive psychology. <laughs> but your team come from all different backgrounds. But they're interested in influencing human behavior change for social good on a huge scale. How does that work? Yeah, um, well, I will say that we have plenty of debates um, about the right way to, to approach problems. But yeah, so my, my background is in experimental psychology from a kind of cognitive and social um, perspective. I have very little exposure to ABA. Um, the exposure I got was, wasn't even in my um, sort of undergrad degree. It was more so we had a postdoc um, who had a, an ABA background on our team for a while. And one thing that I just found really fascinating was um, we could be given the same brief from a policymaker that I want to change this behavior. And if we went away independently and came back with like, here's the thing I think is going to work, we would have two completely different interventions, but both of us would be seen as the psychologists on the team. Um, on the team as well, we have people from uh, kind of pure economics backgrounds who kind of come at it from a completely different angle as well. Um, we had a mathematical neuroscientist for a while, uh, which is a very fancy term, uh, nice one to kind of bandy about. Uh, but then in the institute as well, we have um, sociologists and kind of other, other economists who review our work as well. So what you'll get there is just completely different perspectives on a problem. And I think it kind of comes back then to the need to kind of test these interventions and, and see are they, are they actually going to work. Um, so my bias in any of the interventions that I try to design is from kind of how are people processing this information? Um, like I'd be interested here if, um, if I were to present kind of policy problems CE. So one that we're working on at the moment is like the um, sort of intention action gap when it comes to climate change. And it's pretty much every behavior you can think about. Um, but a lot of the ways that I would come at the problem is sort of, okay, well, what information are people getting when they're about to make the decision to, to do something? Uh, whereas Laura, who had the ABA background, she immediately came at problems from, okay, well, what are people's routines? Where are the habits that they have? How can we kind of help them to put these habits together and so on? Which when I kind of think about the, the habit perspective, I just get a bit scared because um, I don't really know too much about them. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly a challenge, but I think any of the projects that I've worked on that have come from that multidisciplinary background, they certainly benefit from it um, because you're, you're trying to diagnose the problem from multiple perspectives and it kind of helps to make sure that you don't, you don't miss out on it. Um, the other thing that I'll, I'll just kind of um, finish on is coming from it from a psychological perspective means that we often focus on the individual. Um, and like from my perspective as a, an experimental psychologist, I'll focus on the kind of average of a group. The sociologist then will kind of step a bit wider, but it's, it's so important then to have people who are thinking about the, the wider systemic effects of it. Um, and we see that with the policymakers, for example, that like I could I could rock into a meeting from one with one of the funders and be like, oh, look, the intervention worked. Like, why aren't you kind of just rolling this out now? It's, it's done its thing. They are the ones who then have the perspective of, OK, how is this going to interact with the system? Um, so it's kind of it can be frustrating at times, but I can I think important to get all of those minds and voices in the room from from the outset. You mentioned social psychology there. And earlier on today, Julian confessed to me. In my room, 
he said, Porik, I've been reading a lot of social psychology recently. And he said it in those exact tones. And he said, but I think there is a lot to be learned from it. And Shane is talking about social psychology there. Julian, what, where do you see the intersection of group psychology? If we're talking about using behavioral science for big social impact, we have to consider social psychology. But that's not necessarily something that's, that's taught. We usually, you, you mentioned that ABA often focuses on the, visual, in the, in, on the individual apart from some group contingencies. Where do you see that intersection between group social psychology and ABA as it currently stands? <coughs> well, that's a very hard question, isn't it? Uh, I, I, oh, yeah, I, I, I just want to, the, um, just to go, pick up on something Shane, Shane said, and Shane and I had that conversation over coffee as well a little, little while ago. You know, whether you're a behavior analyst or a psychologist, you're, you're brought up to focus on the individual. And of course, in ABA, we spend a lot of time talking about the, we are focused on the individual, but we're talking then about the interaction between them and their environment. And their environment, of course, comprises largely of other people as well as the physical environment as well. So that's where we start off with. But that's where we stay. We stay saying that we're going to look at a target behavior, we're going to measure behavior, we're going to measure behavior in an individual. And we spend a lot of time developing the expertise. I mean, a lot of you are or have been students on master's programs in ABA, and you spend, that's what you spend your time doing, a lot of time developing that expertise and understanding how you measure it, and then how you, how you might devise schemes for changing it. <clears throat> but that's it, isn't it? That's, what, that's the content of a, of a sort of ABA program. It's not about then saying, we're also going to think about the fact that that person, when they're out in the real world, is functioning in various contexts as members of social as members of social groups, and therefore we need to take. There's a lot of very there's a very rich literature of social psychology already about how groups function and how important group membership is, and etc. 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 And, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. and I, I, mean, I haven't I haven't done this. There's a couple of people in the room have been part of a group, which we a small group, which has been meeting in my university in the last number of months, having discussions about developing strategies which, 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 bring, which bring these things together. I, I just think we, uh, <clears throat> we, we, we're kind of, uh, uh, perhaps to change the subject slightly, I mean, I've got very interested in evolutionary science in the last short time, uh, rather belatedly, perhaps. I, I think, I, think I, I didn't think of it ever, I never put the word science after evolutionary uh, until recently, when I read a book, which I, can I, I wave a book around? Absolutely. Okay. But it's a very short so you brought a Tesco bag of books to the, to the presentation. I went to Tesco's and I got a few books. So uh, has anybody read this book? It's called This View of Life, Completing the Darwinian Revolution. It's a good book, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, uh, Dave, David Sloan Wilson is a, uh, a very distinguished evolutionary biologist. And he explicitly says that, and he basically, of course, being an evolutionary biologist, he's a selectionist. And that's the, the point of great commonality between a behavioral perspective and a, and a Bio, a biological evolutionary one, and he says basically <clears throat> that uh, selection operates at a whole different range of levels, and he sees all this as evolution. He doesn't think of evolution just being what happens to the biological organism. He also sees social social evolution as taking place both at the the, the, the level of the psychology of the individual and the, and the group as well. So he's got a hierarchy of levels of, 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 of operation of evolutionary principles, and he sees these principles being all exactly the same principles. They all involve variation and selection. Of course, the details vary enormously at each level of each level of selection, <clears throat> and this is and he and also has got a, he has also got involved with Steve Hayes, who who you'll be more familiar with, and they have written this other book, <clears throat> Atkins, Wilson, and, and Hayes, about uh, taking some ideas that they've got from a, a radical e e economist whose name I always forget is Ost Ostron, who's a, a, a female. Norwegian, I think she's Norwegian, she's uh, an economist, she died a few years ago, but she won the Nobel Prize as being a, a completely radical, non-classical economist. And she looked at the, the, the functioning of groups in society, that was her, 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 her thing. And he, they've rela he's related that to the general ideas about evolution <clears throat> as well. And, and the uh, ACT people have started integrating it into some ideas about how you work with people as, group, uh, as groups to produce better functioning groups. So there's, there's that there, but the links between that and conventional ABA are fairly stretched at the moment because we're not kind of bringing those things together systematically. I always have a difficulty with reinforcer assessments because when we do reinforcer assessments, when we think about it, we've all hit on reinforcer assessments and used them and done them. Have you ever done one for yourself? 
a reinforcer assessment for yourself. Rarely is it something tangible. Usually it's around social identity or values that we have or how we feel about ourselves. And I think when we're talking about social psychology, when we're talking about evolutionary psychology, a lot of this I hear, I'm hearing is reinforcer assessment for ourselves. Because if we're thinking about larger group behavior, and we're trying to apply ABA in our three term or four term or five term contingency. Obviously, part of that, a really important part, is saying, well, what's going to reinforce this population? What the, what's the feedback going to be? We can't just give people tokens or tangibles. Mobile phones will give you a feeling of social connection. And I think there's huge opportunities there. You can see that people get knowledge and connection there when they, they link up with each other as a reinforcer. Can Do I just mention something specific? So, Pat Fryman. Now, this was last year when we had a virtual meeting, wasn't it, Pat? There was a, with Pat, Pat Fryman, actually, I'll tell you about Pat Fryman. Some of you, some of you at least, you've at least seen Pat, Pat Fryman on, 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 on virtually, if not in reality. But Pat is an extremely elegant and extremely funny and very uh, important behavior analyst in, in the States. And he actually came to this conference about eight years ago or so when we had it, the first time we had it here, and the weather was exactly like this. In fact, all you have to do is arrange this conference here. And we've been here three times, and the weather's been absolutely fantastic all three times. Never go to Galway Town, because it always rains there, but have the, have the meeting here. <laughs> uh, and he came, he came in, and I, I met him for the first time in the flesh on that occasion. He was sitting in that bar that we were in last night, Parag and I, for slightly too long. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and he was sitting in the bar, and he said, ah, oh, great to meet you, John. And he said, um, this is a really lovely place. I, I got here yesterday, and I checked in, and... Um, he said, I had a very strange experience. He said, um, I'm going to, there is a, there's a, I, I've got a Pat Fryman thing linking back to what you say, but the anecdote, is going to, the anecdote is going to come first. I had a very strange experience. He said, I came down for breakfast, and I was a bit jet-lagged, because he, he lives in... Uh, uh, where, no, no, he lives right in Nebraska. He lives in Nebraska. And he'd come over from... Come, come over from yeah, he's the only person who lives in Nebraska. Yeah. So he, he lives in Nebraska. He... he, he uh, uh, and he does great, great work there. Uh, he, he said, I, I came down to breakfast this morning, he said, and I went into the dining room, and you probably had, some of you had breakfast there this morning, this big dining room just down here. And he said, I thought all my grandparents were there. Because what they had was they had two coach loads of American tourists, all of a certain age, and they'd all arrived after he arrived late. He said, he came in late, late last night, and there was nobody about. But by the time he came down to the breakfast, the, the, the breakfast room was full of 85-year-old Americans. <coughs> Anyway, so Pat's very witty. Uh, but he gave this talk, um, which he actually called something like The Metaphysics of Behavior Analysis, which is a rather strange title for it, I think. Uh, but, but he gave it to us last year when he wasn't able to come over. He desperately wanted to come back to this hotel and have a good time, but he wasn't able to come because of COVID. And in that, he does, he does um, individual work with relatively wealthy people, like some chief executives who can afford to have individual assessments by a, a, a relatively expensive behavior analyst. And he talked about exactly that. He talked about the fact that their reinforcers are these social values. And we've got to get out of the mindset of assuming that a reinforcer assessment is just something you do with kids when you say, do you want this toy or this toy or access to this activity as a reinforcer? You've got to think we were fun functionally about the frame of reference of the, the, the adult and the mature person and think about what, what motivates them. Mm -hmm. And we don't have, I mean, and that talk, I mean, I think he sees that talk as, along with some of his other talks as being at the edge of the field because we don't have a literature on that stuff. But he says he uses it clinically. He, he gets, he, ha, he sits them on, he has a couch in his office because he, he knows that they, they want psychologists to have a couch. Uh, and then he talks through their, their, their values and their aspirations. And then he talks about programs for them, which is very much along the lines that you were developing just there. Amazing. Yeah, he's a, Pat's a fantastic speaker and he's, He's doing great work, and yeah. hopefully we'll get him back again yeah. in the next year or two, for his sake as much as ours. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, Louise, I want to understand some of the best speakers. Now, remember, we've only 90 minutes, okay? But, but some of the best speakers and how they, how they inspired other people on your calls, on your weekly uh, Zoom uh, interviews. Tell me some of the projects that really caught your imagination or the imagination of the audience and the, the work that they were doing. It's funny you've brought this up because I was just uh, 
chatting with somebody uh, on an early morning call. It's not about this very subject. And it wasn't actually about the speakers we've had in our group. It was about the speakers at Nudge Stop. I'm creating a course at the moment with this new company that I've joined, and it's reflecting over 10 years <clears throat> of Nudge Stop. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, Nudge Stop. 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 As in Woodstock. Nudge, as in Nudge, as in Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler, which is their classic book, Nudge, playing obviously on the Woodstock theme, uh, Nudge Stop. And um, so what I was saying to them was that I'm creating this course, which is celebrating 10 years of Nudge Stock. And in order to find out who would be the speakers that we would recommend, that people new to the subject might like to listen to, maybe foolishly, I thought, well, if they're uh, active on social media and have got loads of followers, they must be extremely interesting people. So this was my first approach as I had the list and... Uh, Somebody like I mentioned before, Nazim Nicholas Taylor, I don't know, God knows how many followers he's got, 800 flipping thousand followers on Twitter. I said, well, he's obviously the most interesting speaker that year. And uh, subsequently, I've gone through uh, 10 years of talks and uh, listened to a lot of speakers. And, you know, it's not always the case. And people have come left of center who, on the face of it, you wouldn't think would necessarily be the most inspiring speaker, but something you were touching on earlier, which is storytelling. And this is one of the essential ingredients to putting across a concept is how you tell the story. And of course, cavemen put uh, paintings on the wall. We are all naturally storytellers. Um, I was listening to a talk recently from Malcolm Gladwell, who's a great storyteller himself and uses them to convey often quite complicated ideas. And he said that he's thinking about things all the time, as we all are, but he'll put an idea to somebody and his dream response is when somebody says, oh, I don't believe it. Or, oh, no, that couldn't be true. And that's what he wants us to feel when we read his stories, because that's what draws us in. And we all understand the concept of the rise and fall, the hero's journey, and uh, the best businesses use it all the time to tell us stories. That's the Pixar recipe, and every single Pixar-produced film, the story might be with different characters, but it certainly follows exactly the same journey, and Star Wars is a classic. And it's it's essential that you tell a story and that you draw your audience in and they want to know. They want to know the end and you hold on to it for a little bit. We were passing Moat yesterday and you were telling me a story and I said to you, tell me that one tomorrow. But I can't remember what it was. <laughs> It might have been the Rory Sutherland story. Were we no. talking about the, um, was it the baby blanket? That's exact. Do you know what? I'd taken the wrong exit. I'd, I'd, I was looking for a, a, a petrol station, and I took the wrong exit, so we took a little Christmas stop tour of South West Meath, Michelle. And uh, the, tell us the story about the baby blanket. Yeah, well, we talked about a number of stories, and, of course, the concept behind baby, behavioral science, the concept that Richard Thaler always says with his book Nudge is nudging for a good. And that, if you would reinforce that, it's the concept of changing, not necessarily actually changing people's behavior, but it's always for good. And that's the underlying. Would you agree, Shane? Yeah, that, that would generally be the aim, but there is kind of a lot of debate on who decides what is. So, the good. Of course, of um, course. So, yeah, it's kind of trying to align people's behavior with what they would choose themselves. Of course, of course. The value of the person making the decision. Uh, of course, it's very relevant. And I told a number of stories to uh, Porig. An example of one of these uh, uh, projects that I'd learned about through Ogilvy, which at the end of the day is an advertising agency. So we might judge them on that. They're trying to sell us things. But this behavioral change unit is behavioral change for good. And um, in the Andes, uh, where um, obviously access to <laughs> mobile phones and ways in which uh, we can communicate with people are very limited. 
they uh, introduced this blanket, which was based on the traditional blanket that the women used to hold their child. And the problem was that the uh, babies were very malnourished. But they didn't know how to tell that their own child was malnourished. So this blanket was created based on, I can't remember the proper term for their traditional blanket, um, but marked into the blanket in the stitch work was just a baby measuring thing that a standard healthcare worker would use. So that very simply, you could lie your baby down on a blanket, you know how old your own child is, and you know that after a certain period, after three months, that the child should be. And so it's a self-help, it's drawing on their own traditions, it's an intervention that doesn't in any way get anybody to try to adopt something that's not part of their own makeup and community, but obviously it's serving an incredibly important, important role. It, it reminds me of, of a, the, a group in London who I do some work with called, called Claremont Communications. And one of their projects was helping children who are from at-risk backgrounds, from poor socioeconomic backgrounds, to hear more words. So a lot of the research would say that children who are coming from at-risk backgrounds, poor socioeconomic settings, would hear fewer words in the first 24 months of their lives. And it was, how can we encourage uh, parents of these children to use more words around them? Okay? And the, the, they were commissioned to, to do this work for a charity called Save the Children. I don't think we have them in Ireland. So they started looking at the behavioral science around this, but also linking in with communications professionals, bib designers, app developers, and creating a whole suite of opportunities for parents to encourage them to talk. So one of the, the neat things that they did was they created an app which reminded a parent, these are the words, your child is a, mo a month older, these are some words that you can use with your child, that the parents downloaded that app. They got it, Connor, you love this, from a QR code that they would have in a doctor's surgery. So they have it stacked. You have to go to your six month checkup. The doctor's gonna hand you some leaflets that have been nicely designed by creatives, not by behavior analysts, because we're not, well, speak for ourselves, couldn't design it, but we've lined up with designers and creatives. And then we go, these are the words that need to be used. They're on an app, they're on a leaflet, they're on a poster that you stick on your fridge. But then there's always that element of, well, when do we prompt somebody to use that behavior? And this is where the bibs came in. So you are sitting down with your child and you're feeding them, and on the bib is, hey, talk to me, all right? Written on the bib. This was there was no behavior analyst involved with this, but when I heard about it, I said, Ben, this is genius. That's our gig. <laughs> and he said, we use a lovely model called the EAST model. Anyone heard of the EAST model? So simple. This is wonderful stuff. In order for a behavioral intervention to be effective, it needs to be easy, it needs to be attractive, it needs to be social, and it needs to be timely. So the app had the option of creating a group of mothers who could talk with each other and fathers to talk with each other about how they're getting on. And they were the principles that they followed. They also used the COMB model, which a lot of you would hopefully be familiar with, or probably when you hear me tell you the elements of the COMB model, you'll be like, but that's my thing, right? But the COMB model says in order for a behavior to occur, we need to understand the capabilities of the person build up their capacity. We need to look at O and the opportunities. Have we created opportunity for somebody to engage in this behavior? And then M, motivation. Is somebody motivated in order to complete that behavior? And that guides this group of creatives, of communications professionals, of marketers to use behavior change for social good with a huge reach. And that's when you told me that story, that crossed my mind. And I want you to tell the other one about planting seeds. Yeah, the other story is in a similar place. Um, it's called something like 
flowers of life. Mm. And again, it was a healthcare story in that in this place in South America, um, for some reason, the female community had a three times higher incident of cervical cancer. I don't know the background to this story. I only read about the solution. And the solution to this problem was that to encourage the women of this very isolated community to attend to an annual uh, regular check-in for a pap smear, a um, specific lily was, it was, I looked this up afterwards, and it was uh, whatever the term is for when you're creating <laughs> new plants, but it was designed, it was an orchid, and it flowered once a year. And it was the flower of life because it was, it was the flower as it bloomed, reminded the community, reminded these women that this was the time that they were to visit and for the rule, the such rule, a simple concept. The rule that they are taught is when this flower goes into bloom, you need to go and get your, your, your pap scan at that stage. And again, not asking anybody to adopt um, something that isn't part of their culture, isn't, it's not people running in and saying, you should be doing this, or this is what we do, so now you do it. It's finding a solution to a problem that doesn't change people's uh, own, own setup. It's, it's the context as opposed to the cognition. Because it's extremely hard. We all understand that's extremely hard to change people our cognitive, we know a lot more now about cognitive science, um, but it's not actually to do with the cognition, it's the context and the environment. And if you can change that, potentially you can then, in its, in its flow, create change. It's the simplicity of those examples that you give that is the most wonderful thing about them. Um, and the babies of the borough case we talked about. Did we? Babies of the <laughs> babies of the borough was actually a, a an Ogilvy project. Tara Austin there is very enthusiastic, and um, the simple thing of the way in which we react to smiling faces, kind faces, and babies' faces in an area of London straight after there had been um, uh, riots. <laughs> And the area had been uh, victims of vandalism on the shops. And uh, what they did was they brought in street artists. And as the shutters went down um, on the shops, the, the shutters were all illustrated, street art style, actually of, from photographs of local people in the community. They donated photographs of babies. And it completely changed the impact in terms of the violent and aggressive behavior that was happening at night time in that area because they had a great big baby's face staring at them. It, it, it links in with the Barry Manilow yeah. effect. And myself and Michelle were lamenting the, the, the death of the slow set at the end of a Midlands nightclub. Not, not for romance reasons, but for behavioral reasons, obviously. That you think about some of the nightclubs that are around Ireland. And as the night goes on, the music gets louder and faster. The drinks get sugarier, sugarier and caffeinated. The, um, the tensions start to rise, you know, and then at that point, they decide the national anthem should be played. <laughs> And everyone should go out onto the street at the same time and queue up for their coats. And you know, people are very rational. They're going to just quietly queue for their coats, quietly queue for the chip shop, you know, parish rivalries and you know, ex-girlfriend, ex-boyfriend rivalries are never going to emerge and people are going to gently wait for a taxi together. It doesn't happen. So we see huge resources employed into making sure that people get home safely, reactively, reactively. 
you pick up the Westmead Examiner and you'll see the court section of you know, a really top-notch person who has loads of references, did something silly because they were drunk or because they were all in an environment that nudged them towards acting the maggot and fighting. And we were saying that what if, and I'm sure this has been done, what if for the last half an hour the slow sets came on? And, you know, people had to just listen to Barry Manilow for the last half an hour. And I know in Sydney, in Australia, they reduced, there was like a half hour like window where they just stopped serving or where people could have less. So you'd, you would still be served up until a particular time, but there'd be a half hour period where you can just slow dance and get your coat at a particular point in time. And there are really big campaigns in Ireland at the moment, like say, give us the night in Dublin, if any of you have come across this who are saying, what should the nighttime economy in Ireland look like? And I'm going, we should be in this conversation. We've lots of insights here around what influences human behavior to create safe streets. You've given some really simple, effective, attractive examples where this can be done in remote communities with very little resources. But actually, we know that the environmental context influences human behavior so much. And that the threat of punishment or retribution or guard the presence is one thing. But on the other side, we know that antecedent intervention, creating a particular environment and a particular feeling, influences human behavior so much more as well. Anyway, you met your husband in Mojo's and that was all, yes. So that was where we were. All right, Shane, I want to know where you see such a list of questions I have here. Fire them up. Um, where do you see behavioral science adding real value to society in the future? And this is a question that I want to ask to all three. And we will get to a Q&A at the end for, for people to ask questions. But where do you see behavioral science adding real value? Right, there are multiple behaviors and policy problems that we do need behavioral science to be applied to and to test. Um, You'll probably notice that I keep going back to the whole testing thing and the the data thing because some ideas can sound nice and that they they're really going to work, but then um, eventually they don't. So if, I might give an example um, of that. That's it's quite famous now in the in the policy realm, but it's um, if people are familiar with play pumps that were installed in Mozambique. So essentially, the the problem there was that um, people had uh, it was very laborious to try get water. That women were spending much of the day at hand pumps, just pumping out the the water. Um, so a social enterprise came along that said, oh, well, the kids are playing on, on these playgrounds, like the, the merry-go-rounds that you kind of run around and spin. That's generating energy and it's going to be able to, to pump the water. So we'll just have, we'll link up those two systems. Um, so my build up here isn't great because you'll probably tell that it's not going to work. Um, <laughs> but what happened was that there was, there was two issues. The, the first was a mechanical one that could have been solved. So the mechanical one was that they needed to be essentially run 24 hours a day um, in order to, to pump enough water. That could have been solved. Um, the second issue was more psychological, that what was initially play for the children turned into labor for the children. And it meant that instead of the women going to use the hand pump that they'd been using for, for years, they then went and had to walk the, the merry-go-round around in circles repeatedly. And uh, there are other, like, other ventures with it that, um, we're kind of trying to add to it. So for example, there's advertising on it from private companies that would then fund them, and then they would have public health messages on it. So th there was really, really good intentions there with it. But they were implemented without being trialed beforehand. So there's no testing done on the, the, the side effects, there's no testing done on it, um, on, on the, the kind of immediate effects of it. Um, so in the end, all of these merry-go-rounds after, after a lot of investment um, and hard labor on the, the parts of the women and children, they were just abandoned and people went back to the to the hand pumps. Um, so I guess like, that I think kind of, if we want to have value um, adding to to any of our problems that we that we face in the in the future, they need to be tried. They need to be kind of the proof of concept needs to be there first. Um, but I think designing them to to give that proof of concept is where the psychological input comes from. Um, so I think it's, it, the value is potentially there, but it does, I think, need to, need to be shown. And I do think that we need to be 
careful that we don't get too comfortable in our in our expertise as well. Sorry, I feel like I'm bringing everyone down after the lovely <laughs> examples. <laughs> it's such a great story, and I I really enjoy listening to them, and I want to to hear more of them. If you've more examples, please do share. Not to put you on the spot. Uh, of, of failures. Um, <laughs> oh, look, if you want to oh, have a look please. at my publication list. <laughs> <laughs> of, of successes or of failures or of examples where you've come together to, like you've spent the last two years um, looking at, at COVID and, and influencing all of us on our day-to-day -day basis. How did Tell us about yeah. some of those. So, can, uh, one of the things that um, kind of struck me during the pandemic initially was that there was a lot of coverage in the media of all of these people who are breaking the rules. Um, so, there's a kind of, uh, there was a, it nearly seemed like there was an agenda there to kind of highlight, okay, these are people who are, who are not, they're not like me. They're not kind of doing what they should be doing. We were collecting data on it and we found that it was an extreme minority of people who weren't paying attention, but because everyone else was at home, these were the ones that we could see out and about. So it really biased our, our perceptions of, of what was really going on. I think that's where the getting the data was useful. So we had, um, we've been running studies since um, the, the pandemic first, first started and what that showed was that a lot of people were very, very worried and were very willing to kind of make sacrifices and everyone here knows that we did uh, make those sacrifices the motivations for making those sacrifices were, were not to protect ourselves it was to protect other people in our community um but they weren't the messages that were kind of being put out there in the media and i'll say as well that the if you want to kind of move into the policy space and get sort of aba recognized in the policy space the media is the the sort of the, the avenue to get there because policymakers are responding to what's going on in the media so we had multiple people come to us afterwards and say that, oh, we didn't realize how many people were still really worried about it because they were just hearing what was going on in the media. Even now, we still have, um, I think our, our latest estimate is that there's 25% of people will rate themselves as like extremely worried about COVID, which is much higher than I think um, many people would, would expect. So it's through those sorts of informing the, the media discussion. Um, and I think we had, we had chats about this, um, was where the kind of the data measurement and, and everything came in. And in general, a lot of what we tried to do from the outset were things like, um, okay, how do we get across the idea of how important it is to socially distance? We ran the study and was like, actually, that, that wasn't necessary. People had already bought that. They kind of they bought into it immediately. So we then focused on other things like, um, okay, well, if people are worried, how well are they evaluating risk? And so one of the studies that we ran um, in May 2020 was showing that people hadn't really absorbed the message about indoor and outdoor locations as that, that being the important thing. So that then informed the, the communications going forward to, to try to hammer home that message about the importance of ventilation. Um, so there, it is kind of, I guess the, the point I'm trying to stress there is that we have these assumptions. These assumptions can be biased by the information that we're getting from the media and so on, but without the, the data behind it, we can't really be certain what's going on. What, what I really like about the approaches that you've taken in the last two years, though, is that, yes, the media are saying, are, are trying to put forward a particular narrative, but you're testing those with, you're testing the question that is being posed by that narrative, and you're giving solid data based upon that. But not only that, you're in that is informing approaches at both a policy level, a governmental level, and also getting that message out to the media to say, hold on a second, actually, people still are worried about this, or people are taking the actions that are required. And you're almost reframing some of the, the narrative that was going out there, which I thought was really, really effective, that it wasn't just a case of, well, actually, do you know what, whispering, they're wrong. You were getting out there, and you represented really well to, to and really effectively, I think having a, a director that's also previously a journalist helps, you know, but it's, yeah, it's really, really good. Yeah, that's it. I think um, one of the things that I realized since joining this role, so like previously I would, would have just been kind of pure um, academia, is that the importance of the relationship with the, the, the message, kind of as we said earlier, and speaking that message in the language that your audience can, can understand. Um, that's the important one. Now, now, one of my favorite parts of the sort of media engagement we do in the job is kind of going on the local radio um, over the, the national, because you have more time to just kind of chat and have a conversation about it. Um, my, my local one in, in Carlow at home, they, um, they do call me Dr. Shane um, when I go on, <laughs> which um, just always makes me think of, of Dr. Phil. <laughs> um, but 
I think get, giving people then the the evidence that's that's coming through that actually the the person at home who thinks that because they're reading this in the Irish Times or they're hearing it on the news that there's all these people gathering and every it's all the caution has gone out the window, making them then stress about it and the anxiety about it. You hear then from actually no, that's not what the evidence shows that the majority of people are like me, and I think those sorts of messages are are important to get out. Yeah. Okay, we're starting to to take the foot off the accelerator and. and ease our way into landing. I want to go back to you, Julian. And I want to, this is actually for all three of you, but I'm going to start with Julian. What personal qualities do you think make a good behavior change specialist? I, I think that a lot of these, the answer to that is largely a general one. I mean, the, the, the skills required in interacting with others are general to many, many roles. And I think they, they're, they're clearly very important for a behavior change specialist because you've got to be able to present yourself. You've got to be able to establish rapport with a range of, a range of clients, professionals, people you, people you, people you work with. Um, and then I think alongside that, I suppose I would just put um, academic uh, sort of tra qualities that have been trained into them, if you like. I mean, I think what we bring to every situation, and interestingly, um, Shane obviously brings out as well is a, is a focus on on the behavioural data, and the, and the importance of uh, of recording it and then making making decisions based on that. I'm sure many people in the room have worked with other education professionals who have said, and they've been saying, well, we want to collect data on this. That you, the ABA person, has been saying that, and they've been saying, well, we're far too busy to do that. We've got all these other tasks. We've got we've got to do this with the kids or this with the system, and we can't be doing with that. You can do your intervention if you like. Uh, and we're the people who say, no, you really, really do. We really do need the data. Um, and we're not the only people in, in, in the world saying that, but we are, it's, it's so central to our training that that's what the, one of the first things we bring to every situation. Um, and I think, you know, <laughs> insofar as that's a personal quality, I think it's one that every, every behavior analyst brings. And it's going to remain, I think, central to us having a, a significant role. Um, so. Yeah, no. Louise, same question. You're coming at this from, from maybe a, a little bit of a different angle, but again, what are the qualities that, that you think somebody who is a good behavior change specialist should have? Well, I'd echo what Julian said, because essentially, if a subject is to be accepted as a science, it has to show results. So absolutely, every project has to be tested um, I think that within behavioral science, even with its very short history, has already seen issues in that department with replication crisis. But that's just been, to me, um, a benefit because you begin to ask questions, the why was there a replication crisis? And that then opens a whole new area of then recognizing that uh, just because a, you know, an eminent Nobel winner uh, wrote a book about these uh, tests that he carried out, the fact that they were carried out with um, uh, 100 white males in uh, Harvard University, then becomes obvious that well, that'll be hard to replicate. So obviously, uh, as I say, I absolutely uh, echo what Julian says, the science, the testing is, uh, but in terms of qualities, I'll come back to the word I use, which is curiosity, um, uh, just a keenness to learn, and uh, just a wide focus. Uh, like, okay, I don't know anything about anthropology, but that looks really interesting. And obviously, you've got something to do about human behavior. So bring it to the bring it to the table, bring it on, bring your speciality. Let's share it. And as uh, Shane was saying, the strength of the unit there is the diversity of learning, so that everybody's ans asking different questions, and to continue asking questions. We don't necessarily know the answer, but as we go down the path with another question, uh, we might come to some clarity. We might not come to any clarity at all. Oh, another just, question even. Yeah, know? another question. Thank you for that. Shane, same question. Yeah, so mine is, um, so my answer is probably in quite a similar vein to the previous two, but um, it's a, probably be unsurprising for people here that I was I was a bit of a nerd in school. Um, I went down the, the sort of sciences route, learned there was a science about kind of human thinking and so on. I was like, yep, sign me up. Um, so originally that was because I wanted to know how do things work? Like what is the truth of, of what's going on? And you think like as a scientist, then that's going to be my job is going to be telling people how things really work. Increasingly learned that instead of kind of wanting to spread 
truth, you actually want to spread doubt as a scientist. Um, so you want to kind of instill that sort of curiosity. Like, you know, I think this is going to work, but, but I'm not so sure. Um, and then kind of increasingly, I'm finding it more comfortable um, to be doubtful of, of what's going to work. Really helps with the imposter syndrome as well. <laughs> Very good. Um, I want to ask two more questions. All right. I want to know, now remember we've, we've limited time, Louise. So what are your recommended, Louise is an avid reader. Like when she talks about books, it's like a day or two days and she has a book read. Um, what are your recommended readings, podcasts, courses, or people to follow for anyone who is interested in this? Am I kicking this off first? You sure are. I'm a great podcast fan. I don't know if anybody else here likes to listen to podcasts. It's amazing what you can learn in such a short time. Um, within the field of behavioral science, the first one that comes to my mind is a podcast called Behavioral Grooves. Um, two guys working in the behavioral change field, very qualified, just have fantastic guests, always asking different questions. Um, Katie Miltman out of uh, UPenn has her own podcast, Choiceology, I think her one might be. And um, a great friend of Behavioral Science Club is Melina Palmer. And Melina is a behavioral economist. She brings um, the economics lens to our human behavior. And she has a podcast called Brainy Business. Fantastic guest. She's got a beautiful silken voice that just sort of lulls you along on your walk as you're listening to her. Obviously, voice is very important in a podcast. So they're the three I'd sort of put at the top. Um, in terms of courses, it depends, obviously, whether you're looking for an introduction to the subject. It depends how far down the road you are. The company that I work for, 42 courses, it's how I came across them in the first time. I was, uh, I was doing their online courses for 18 months, and now... Uh, and now I bought the company. I work, I would now work for them, but their very first course was a course hosted by Rory Sutherland, who in this room might not be a name that you're familiar with, but when I talk with people like Porig, he's sort of a little bit of a folk hero for us in that he came, as I said, from, from Ogilvy and with a pure sense of curiosity, asked questions. And they're things that seem obvious when he asks them, but they're little things like, you know, what's, what's important to you when you get the train? And it's not to do with whether it's uh, fast, like an engineer would say, well, as long as you get from A to B in a certain period of time, if, you know, we got them there. But what's more important to us is that we've got a seat and that when it's delayed, we know why there's a delay going on or that if you're sitting on the train. So we actually have very different needs as a consumer, a customer, than the engineer who designs the tool for us. Do you know what Rory said that I, my, the favorite question that he asked? He asked why we're not using Zoom and video conferencing in 2018. He asked that question. He said, why is this not happening? But my favorite one was, why don't we all have two dishwashers? I was like, what? That makes no sense at all. And he said, think about your day. You fill your dishwasher, and then you empty it, and then you put it back in. He said, okay, it's going to be one fixed cost, but at some stage, your dishwasher is going to break, and you'll always have another one. But the main thing he said was, you have one dishwasher with clean delf, the other one with dirty delf, right? And I was listening to him go, wait a minute. So then you never have to, st and he goes, you save space in your house, because all your <laughs> dishes are like, Rory. You've opened my mind, and he goes, you put all your cutlery and your gels into the di two dishwashers, and you've no other need for space, because all you have is clean stuff, take it out, when it's finished, put it in the dirty one, turn that on, now it's clean, this was the dirty one. <laughs> and my life has changed since then, that was like BC, now it's 80, now I, I couldn't afford a second dishwasher. <laughs> it's still, but if anyone here is thinking about it, look it up. Obvious questions. I they're, know. They're too obvious. It's too obvious. And that's a, that's a talent to question what we take for granted as everyday services, everyday behavior, the things that drive us mad, like when things break, mm -hmm. bad UX, 
bad user that we design. just put up with. And why do we put up with it? Mm -hmm. Searching at the bottom of the page on the website because, well, I want to contact a human. I'm just trolling down. No, I've, there's no way I can even find out who bad UX. The, the wait time, when I go on to ring customer service for anything, I'll never press the button for the customer service. I'll press the button for sales. You know? Because you'll get answered straight away. And I say, oh, sorry, I didn't realize. <laughs> My finger must have slipped, but now that I have you, you'll always get answered. And apparently you? if you swear very loudly at the top of your voice, who, they, 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 there's some kind of alert goes off that you better answer this person really quickly. <laughs> but, but, but bad design is, is an interesting one. I was teaching in Trinity a, a couple of, maybe you know the room that we're in, right? Uh, a few weeks ago. And there was a door at the bottom kind of there, right? And it had a handle on it and a pad, but it had the handle on it. And I used to knock great crack for the two days, watching people pull the door. But of course, the handle wasn't meant to be there. It was a push door. But because of the design, it nudged and told people the antecedent of the handle said, pull the door instead of push the door. Bad design. Look at it the next time. It's great crack. And where are the coat hangers? They're over the far side of the room. So what happens? Students just throw their coats, naturally enough, myself included, throw them on the chair, throw them on the ground. And you say, well, of course, this is a problem. But when you put that into multiples and multiples and multiples and multiples of people, and you look at design, not design for aesthetic, not design for functionality, but design for behavior change, you go, actually, do you know what? We know how to make things easy, or we should know how to make things easy, and make environments with enough prompts for us to do what we want you to do. Um, Shane. Well, Louise has taken my, my podcast recommendation of Choiceology. Um, Katie Malkman is, is a good one. Um, in terms of books and actually following on from the, the design discussion, Invisible Women by uh, Caroline Criado Perez. If you haven't read it and just want to be infuriated at design <laughs> and how policies are made, um, I'd recommend that one. What's it called again? Uh, Invisible Women. Invisible Women. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, I think outrage is a good motivator, um, and that's that's a good book for that. Um, other ones, um, in terms of the sort of the need for psychology and how and how people behave when it comes to regulating companies, uh, fishing for fools, um, both uh, F words spelled with a PH, and um, that's George Akerlof and Robert Schiller. Um, and then in terms of people to follow, so again, Katie Milkman on, um, on Twitter is, is a good one. And then um, from an Irish perspective, Liam Delaney, who is uh, now at LSE in London, but used to be at UCD. Um, so he's someone who had a chat with me when I was finished my PhD, and that's how I kind of ended up working in the space. Uh, but someone who does um, really, really good work in the behavioral space, uh, really good work in terms of the ethics of, of what we do. Um, and yeah, just generally open to kind of other disciplines. Um, so yeah, kind of a, a good person to just see what he's up to. He's got a great blog. Yes, just, yeah. He shares all of his work there. It's good suggestions. And Julian? Well, I think I'll just mention the two books that I already mentioned to make it le less complicated. So this is, uh, David Sloan Wilson has written various books, but this is this one called the, This View of Life is short and recent uh, about his views about evolutionary science. And then he's actually an author on this if you want to broaden your perspective and see how you might integrate social groups act in a behavioral perspective. This book is called Pro Social, using evolutionary science to build productive, equitable, and collaborative groups. And those are the, those are the features that they emphasize derived from the, the, the uh, general ideas about functioning groups that they, they discuss at the beginning of the book. And if you want to, um, I'm not a great podca uh, podcast listener to, to her, but. Uh, I think you could get stuff by you can get stuff by Pat Fryman. And the reason everyone wants him to come to ABA meetings is that he's the most he's the best motivational speaker. Every time you hear a talk by Pat, you think you go out a million dollars on top of the world. He's told you you're a saint for working in the field, uh, and he convinces you of that. So, and you can find his stuff online as well. I would highly recommend that you uh, join the Behavioral Science Club on LinkedIn. I've heard great things about it. <laughs> uh, just I. Not run by a very astute marketer, but look it, here we go. Uh, I've written a few here that should have been on the, um, on the board. Obviously, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman is uh, magnificent. Uh, Dan Ariely's Predictably Irrational is just a wonderful read, and it's a delve into behavioral economics. 
Uh, obviously, we've mentioned nudge, but there's also a term called sludge, which we'll be very familiar with. Again, I'll use these terms and you'll go, what does it mean? And then you'll go, but that's my word. Sludge is making things hard to do. Sludge is making a choice that's not going to be very good for you, quite difficult. Back to Mojo's with us. If it's harder to order a drink, you're less likely to do it. And a lot of the time it's administrative burden, okay? But thinking about a nudge is going to encourage you through environmental choice architecture, and a sludge is going to make it more difficult for you to make that choice. Think about it in terms of you get up in the morning and you have your bike, or you have your car, and you're making a decision between which of these am I going to use? Reducing sludge would mean having your gear packed, having a shower at work, having a cycle path available for you to, to cycle on. Sludge for your car would be traffic jams, would be cost, would be all of those. So that's, that's we are thinking, okay, can we construct an environment uh, around that? Um, I've talked about design. I'm not a designer, but Amy Boucher, B-U-C-H-E-R, has written a book that I am reading actually getting some reading in these days as well, as minding a baby and work, but it's called Engaged, Designing for Change. Uh, and I'm riveted by it, because she's talking about these bloody vibrating watches and apps and websites and services and cars and how they're influenced by behavioral science. And how all of the stuff that we do and talk about and apply in the different schools, health and social care settings that we're in are actually being used by these products and services as well. And it's joining the dots for us. Um, Charles Duhigg has the power of habit. Um, one final thing I would say is to try and get into the habit of producing, of having some sort of output for yourself. Be it writing down, be pestering your family and explaining to them how behavioral science can be useful in the real world. And take a problem. This is, we, you were asking me yesterday, how did I get into this? And said, I was presented with a problem. And I said, no, 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 no. I don't know anything about that. And then I, I was asked, can you solve that problem using the knowledge that you have in ABA? I said, okay, well, what you would do I suppose is you'd create a prompt here, you try and increase the response effort, you probably make sure that there are alternative responses being taught and use skills and think about capacity. And immediately you're going, wait a minute, that, to a, a lay person listening, they're going, that makes a lot of sense. I would never have thought about it that way. And going back to what Shane had said, that people come at these problems from different angles. I think that there's a clear pathway, a clear road for behavior analysis to enter into these discussions to solve some of these social issues quite effectively. Um, I'm gonna finish with kind of on this theme before we go to Q&A. Where do opportunities for behavioral scientists lie going into the next 10 years? Louise. I think I said to you on the way down here that uh, if you Google uh, behavioral scientist or behavioral science plus must have, you'll get a fair few number of pages that come up because that is the conversation that behavioral scientist, the chief behavioral officer, however you wish to term this role the person is playing is the must have role and every company is realizing that they need to have somebody to look at whatever their product is from a behavioral lens and it's a sort of infinite question that you've asked us because every job needs a behavioral lens and so we see it at the moment in traditionally in uh, finance and so you bring in behavioral economics we see it in insurance anywhere as uh, Shane was saying where you have to fill out a form you need a behavioral scientist because you have to understand the behavioral process that goes on in the mind as you are uh, a approaching a website. I mean, obviously web design, we think of the very obvious things like the Googles and the Twitters who obviously are using our behavior to make their product work. But every 
business, whatever it is, needs to see things through the behavioral lens. If you've got a customer, you need to judge their behavior. We see this week on Tuesday that now the default option for all employees is that they're auto-enrolled into pensions. Does anyone see that during the week? So we're all going to have to lose out on some of our fund money and stick it into our pensions instead. And that's auto-enrollment. And that was one of the core tenets of, of Nudge, was that actually having a default option is really important for us when we're trying to nudge behavior. So something like organ donation, that the effort that's involved, we all would probably feel somewhere within us. Most of us would say we want to donate our organs. But then how many of us have actually had a donor card or filled out the forms or have let us, let us know? And, and that intention and the action, we all know that we want to have a pension or plan for our future, but then there are barriers to that. So having a default option is something that influences every single web experience that you have. When you leave this room and you go on to Google on your phone, the first thing they'll say is, do you want to allow cookies on your phone? And that emerged because the default option was there to say, before it was you were giving away your data, whereas now you're being asked, do you want to or do you not want to? And that again emerged from behavioral science research. Shane. Yeah, so, I mean, opportunities anywhere that um, it involves a human behavior um, is probably the, the kind of the broad answer. But where I kind of see it happening specifically and in the, in the public sector space is in relation to the environment um, and climate change. I think that's going to be the, the kind of the big one because I think increasingly policymakers are realizing that um, tackling the climate crisis, there are going to be some technological solutions, but the behavioral ones are going to be um, kind of at the center of it. Um, so you can see it with um, some public sector organizations. So the Environmental Protection Agency recently advertised for a behavioral scientist, um, the Sustainable Energy Authority. So they have a behavioral team um, working for them. So I think increasingly there's going to be in the public sector and in the, the private sector. Um, I think that's the space where um, behavior change is going to be needed. And it, I think it, it seems clear to me anyway, as someone who's very naive with ABA, but that's, that's somewhere where there's a lot of behaviors there that could use that sort of lens or framework in terms of how they might align with people's intentions. And I, I, I will just say as well that all of the sort of survey data we have shows that people do have those intentions and do think climate change is a serious problem. The vast majority of people do, but it's kind of aligning the behaviors with um, the desired behaviors um, is, is where the issue is going to lie, I think, in the next few years. A lot of the students in that classroom in Trinity tell children to hang up their coats when they go into school every day, but the environment wasn't created to nudge them towards actually hanging up their coats when they went in. And a lot of us, myself included, find ourselves not having those intentions, but maybe not being, finding ourselves in the environment that makes it easy to make the right choice. Maybe it's not the right individual choice. Maybe it's the right choice for everyone else in the room or everyone else in the world. So, Julian, final question. So this is where, where the future lies for behavioral science. Where do you see opportunities yeah. lying? Well, I, I think if you look through the pr rest of the program of this meeting, the keynote, the, this afternoon session and the keynote addresses tomorrow, they address four different areas of application and extension of behavior analysis into sort of adjunct areas. So I'm just prompting you to look at the program and <laughs> remind you what's on, because they're all, they're all quite different, uh, but they all clearly represent things that are not typically seen as core areas for, for us. Uh, and I, I think that demonstrates that we are getting involved in a, a range of cognate areas. More generally, I think the opportunities are there. If you're in academia, you, there are opportunities to be get involved in multi multidisciplinary grant proposals, which involve specialists from many areas. Uh, I think, in a way, Shane has the ideal job where he's actually in a unit which is if it, which is em employed to be continuously multidisciplinary. Most of us don't have that opportunity, but we can at least look around and see see many many, many opportunities to at least apply with other people for particular pots of money, and some of those will get, get funded, and then we will have that credibility as a subject specialist that you talk about in more areas, and therefore, five years down the road, we might, we might have done two or three more projects in the same area, and thus had a, a, a foot in two camps. Both, <clears throat> It's very important, I, I think, for all of us in this room that we have that core expertise, but that we also start working out how to link it to other expertises going forward. I think. So the subject specialist, yeah. yes. That's brilliant. Okay, thank you so much for your time this morning. And I'd like to thank Louise Ward, Shane Timmons, and Julian Leslie for joining me this morning.